this is the second part which comments on all the inequality and this time we will prove the very general version of this whole inequality uh, for that purpose I need to introduce a new collection of functions which is called LP space and that's what it is uh, LP space associated with a given measure space it will be a collection of all uh, measurable functions with respect to this measure space such that the pth power of the absolute value of this function is integrable like this you can associate the sort of norm or a special number attached to the to every function like this to every function from this class that's that's what we're going to use for this norm for this symbol uh, and that is defined like this so it is the l1 norm of the pth power and then taking the root p here or if you, you want to see the explicit form of it that's the explicit form of the norm in the LP space. Now, given the this new class of functions and given the this quantity, the held inequality, the general version of the held inequality looks like this. For two, by the way, here the p is a non-negative number. Sorry, positive number. So this class exists. You can define this class for every positive number p, in fact. And it's it's a simple observation. If p is one then the LP space defined like that will coincide with the just class of measurable functions. Now, we now choose two positive numbers P and Q such that they are connected by this relation. In fact, if you have two positive numbers which are connected by this relation, they inevitably will be bigger than 1 straight away because, because if, the, if, for instance, Q positive means that this fraction is positive, which means that this fraction must be less than 1, so the denominator might be should be larger than one. Now we fix two functions, one of them from LP and the other one from LQ. P and Q are connected like this. Now the held inequality now looks like so. Um, yeah, You can recognize in fact the held inequality I proved in my previous comments if you allow P here be exactly 1. When P here exactly 1, this fraction must be 0. And informally speaking, to make this 0, you have to assign Q here infinity. And then you will have P1 and Q infinity. And that will be the version of the whole inequality we proved earlier. This is just an informal consideration which includes that, that inequality we proved earlier in my previous comments into this general scheme. You cannot you cannot use the proof which I'm going to present for this inequality for P and Q numbers to prove that that to, to, to prove the inequality with the infinity here and the one here. The, you have to prove it the way we proved it in my earlier comments in the comments which preceded these ones. Now after that out of the way let's just try to prove that. Um, by the way actually another comment which I'd like to make uh, this inequality in general it's called holding inequality in a special case when P and Q are Number two, they will satisfy this relation. This will call this is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Right. Uh, I will prove this. There is a very nice, simple elementary proof for this result, and it based on the following observation, which I call lemma. Uh, and lemma says that you always have the inequality like this between two non-negative numbers a and b. Uh, this is elementary lemma. And the proof is just a simple, uh, simple one-dimensional extremum problem. Uh, all you have to do, you have to consider a function f of t like this for all non-negative t's, and then you have to study this function for max and mean uh, over this interval. We all know how to do that. It's the first year stuff. Uh, we have to check the values of the function in the endpoints, which are like this. Uh, and then we have to compute the derivative, which is like so. We have to see where my derivative is zero. Uh, this is easy thing. If you solve this, you will have that the derivative is zero at the special point, which I keep denote t naught, which is uh, p take one root of the point b. Given the relation between p and q like this, you can solve for q, and that will be the solution, and then you can replace it with this thing. Now we can finish our extremum analysis. Uh, I have to compare the values of my function at 
endpoints uh, with the value at the point T0. At the point T0, if I sub it in here, if I sub in T0 here, this value will be just p to the power q because of this relation. This value just, just stays. When you sub it in here, you will have something like this. Again, because of this identity, it will be just b to the power q, and altogether function delivers value 0. So what we see, my function f is non-negative, and in fact takes the minimal value at the point t0 like this. That's why we have this inequality, because this is exactly equivalent to the statement that f is non-negative. So that's what, that's what I said here, f is non-negative for every t bigger than 0. And that's, that finishes the proof of the lemma. Now, if I have this lemma, I can argue this inequality like this. I can introduce two auxiliary functions, f1 and f2 and g1, like this. Or, in fact, uh, to be absolutely precise and careful, I have to say first that if my function, if the denominator here is 0 or if the denominator here is 0, that would imply that either f or g identically 0, or almost everywhere is 0, which will render this integral 0, and the inequality will be true trivially. So we now consider the case where both numbers like this are non-zero, then I can divide, then I can introduce these auxiliary functions. Uh, I will observe that actually the p and q norms of them respectively just one. And it's a very easy thing to check by this identity, these are just numbers. Uh, and now I can say that the left hand side here can be replaced with something like this. All I have to do now, I have to estimate this piece. And for this piece, I'll make this observation. If I use this inequality for these two numbers, f1 of x and g1 of x, I will have this inequality for every x in my universal set x. Now all I have to do, I have to use the comparison principle again. I have to integrate this left-hand side and the right-hand side. If I do that, the integral here delivers 1. Here it is. The integral here delivers again 1. And then by this relation, the whole right-hand side will be just 1. And I have, and I have this. So this factor is controlled by 1, and that's why this factor is controlled by these two. And that finishes the proof of cauchy schwarz inequality. Uh, there's a second part here again, uh, similarly to my argument in my preceding comments, uh, which is called sharpness. So this inequality is sharp, and that's how it sounds. Look at this. sharpness part of the whole inequality says that if you take a supremum across all g's from the unit ball of LQ, so for across all g's from LQ with the, this condition, that's something we call unit ball, then the supremum will be this value. Whole the inequality of course delivers the inequality like that. We have to show the opposite one, and again we will show the opposite one by presenting, by presenting the representative, and again this time this will be a sharp presentation. So remember that P and Q are connected like this, or you can solve for Q like this. Now we can go after the representative. The construction of the representative, it's a two-stage process. First I'll introduce the function G0, like this. What I claim is, if I, or that if I compute the Q integral of my G0 function, if I sub it in, I'll have something like this. And uh, with the help of this relation, this is just the p integral of f. Uh, if you recall what's the definitions of the of this symbol and of this symbol, you can say you can rewrite this identity in a simple terms like this. Because the left hand side here is the left hand side here to the power q. And the right-hand side here is the right-hand side here to the power p. Uh, now, the representative where this supremum will be attained is now given like this. It's a g naught, which is divided by this value. Obviously, for such g naught, we have 
the relation like this. So this G, sorry, for such G, we have a relation like this. So this G is indeed in my unit ball. All I have to argue now, all I have to argue now, I have to argue the left hand side here delivers this value, is the argument, is the left hand side. When I sub in my G function, I have something like this, right? Because that's the denominator of G, which is a number outside the integral. Uh, G naught times F delivers F to the power P. Uh, this one, this value, is the norm of P to the power P, subtract this denominator. Here it is. And again, referring to this identity, makes it just what it should be, makes it just right hand side in here. That's why, that's why the held inequality is sharp. Unlike my previous comments, we don't have to do a second version of sharpness where we take the supremum over f rather than g, and the reason for that is that the held inequality is symmetric thing. I mean, to swap g and f, all you have to do, you have to swap p and q over.